Welcome back, folks, to Swift on Sundays. My name is Paul Hudson. If it's your very first time here, uh, welcome. If you're a repeat visitor, uh, you're extra welcome. Hopefully you know the format by now. I will outline it just really fast for the folks who are new. Uh, our goal is to try and build a Swift UI app, in this case, uh, from scratch in, I don't know, about an hour. That's my ultimate goal, an hour or so. Often we go a little bit long because I want to add more and more cool things to the app. Um, once or twice we've had really long apps, like two hours long, but our goal is about an hour or so. Uh, with questions along the way um, from you kind folks who have uh, uh, come along to hopefully ask some. I hope you brought your questions with you. Um, and the rules for Switch on Sundays are pretty straightforward. Uh, first up is that I ensure zero harassment. I want everyone to feel welcome and encouraged to be here and have a good time while they're here. Uh, second, uh, if you have questions about what I'm doing right now, uh, please go ahead and ask them straight away in the chat window um, because that way I can uh, see them, I can stop what I'm doing, slow down a bit, answer a question, and, and then move on again. If you have questions about everything else, like Swift UI versus UI Kit, Swift UI versus Flutter, Swift UI versus the Patriots game, whatever it is going on elsewhere in the world, um, chill out. Ask those at the end, otherwise it just really uh, blows my brain with speed bumps. So you can hold back the off-topic stuff to the end, that'd be awesome. Otherwise, keep the on-topic stuff uh, as we go. Um, now, as a reminder, I am using, you know, Mac OS Catalina and Xcode 11 um, and so forth. It's a little bit uh, iffy here and there, so if we have any comedy disconnects, I'll do my best to figure it out. Uh, otherwise, we'll just pick up and go along. Uh, yes, you can see I'm I'm on brand for, for Ben, re re represent. <laughs> and a screencast. Uh, anyway, so the project making today um, is brilliant. I, I, you know, I really wanted to push the boat out a little bit because this is this is episode twenty, our twentieth complete app we've built um, in in this time. So um, I wanted to really work on something more interesting and something harder. And I thought, how about you make a, a Swift UI game, and not just like you know your average sort of list of table cells and stuff. Um, something more advanced. Something that really is going to push your brain hard. Uh, and that's fun, right? So we're going to build a game um, that um, is a word game where the player has uh, letter tiles saying things like um, dare, D-A-R-E. I'll just wait for you. Uh, that's a word. And across the bottom are 10 alternative letter tiles. And it's their job to drag one of those out and replace one in the four-letter word to make a new four-letter word against the clock. And they score points as they go by making four-letter words against a timer. They've got to go as fast as they can. And, of course, they can't just make up words. They've got to have real, actual words there to work with. So that's what we're going to try and make. And there's all sorts of interesting things in here I'm looking at. Um, like how you do game-style drag-and-drop is itself challenging in Swift UI. I uh, hope you'll learn something there. And of course, having the timer and the scoring and the effects and so forth. Hopefully, um, this will be a fun project. And at the end of it, honestly, there's so much more you can do with this that we're not going to have time for. Um, and we'll see what we can get through. Anyway, so uh, there are some assets for this project. Now, if you are following along this video later on, if you're watching the replay of this video tomorrow, whenever, next week, next month, do not use this link. This link is not for you. This link is a temporary link to give folks the assets that they want to follow along in the meantime while they're watching it live. The, the assets for you, followers in the future, um, will be on GitHub <laughs> with all the rest of the Swift on Sundays projects. So get them from there, please, not from the link I'm about to post into the chat window. I'll just post it now. Um, bada boom. So there is the link for folks who are following along live right now to grab the assets from for this project. Uh, and uh, you'll see is there's some graphics in there and some text files. Uh, I'm going to use them all shortly. So I'm going to go ahead and try and share my screen. This is normally where if Kathleen is going to catch fire, this is where it's going to happen. <laughs> so uh, let's see if it's going to catch fire or not. Let's find out. So I'm going to try and share my screen and watch this not catch fire, not catch fire. Boom. There we go. Okay. It has not caught fire. Awesome. Great. Okay. So, oh, no, you can't see my NS Screencast hoodie anymore. NS Screencast. Love you, Ben. Anyway. Um, here's Xcode 11.1. .1. Um, you can use 11.2 if you want to. It doesn't really matter. 11.x is fine, as long as it's some sort of stable release. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by um, 
making a new project. So I'll choose File, New Project. How's my screen look? My screen look okay? Can you see everything? Yeah, you can see everything just fine, can't you? Yeah, it looks good. I'll do File, New Project. File, New Project. Boom. Uh, and in this instance, we're going to use Mac OS. Now, the code is identical on iOS, literally line for line, exactly the same. But on iOS, we have to think about, well, are you on a 10 uh, or 11 Pro Max or a 10 regular, whatever sizes, 10R, um, portrait landscape, yada, yada, yada. With a Mac app, we can focus on the game logic rather than worrying about different layout constraints and similar. Um, so it's not a problem to do it on iOS if you want to, but it'd be much, much easier to uh, use Mac OS. I can indeed make the chat window narrower. Um, Prathamesh asks, can I use Mojave? Yes, of course you can use Mojave. Um, the live preview, you'll see it sort of whizzing by occasionally. Um, it's not really that um, exciting. Um, you can do without it. And because we're using Mac OS, you press Command R and it kind of runs almost immediately. Uh, if you've got a modern Mac. Um, so it's actually a nice side effect of using a Mac OS app rather than an iOS app is that you get instant playback of stuff most of the time. Anyway, so um, go ahead and choose Mac OS for your template type and choose app. Uh, and I'm gonna call this thing switcheroo, like that. Uh, make sure you have Swift UI chosen for your UI template technology, otherwise this will be a baffling um, presentation. Uh, then press next and create on your desktop like that. Cool. Okay, so I'm gonna start off real simple. We're gonna go ahead and um, just build a sort of basic layout to work with, with the assets I've given you already. So if I, in my, in my finder window somewhere, there we go. These are the assets you should now have. Uh, start TXT contains a handful of words to start the player off. They're kind of fairly easy to work from. Uh, bite, cane, core, dare, dent, and so forth. Oh, Konath, I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. Yes, sorry. Mojave will sync you. So if you want to follow along and you have not got Catalina, you'll have to use an iPad uh, in landscape. Should do it, yeah. It'll still, still work, the code is identical. Um, but yes, of course, Catalina requires Mac OS. That's uh, why it requires Mac OS. Catalina, my mistake. Thanks, Konath, sorry. You can use iPad Pro, just be careful. Anyway, start words, boom, these things here. And also words TXT, which is basically a list of four letter words um, that uh, exist that will let the player work with and of course it has some great words like bums there you go and burn and bush and care and cart and so forth uh, and those are the words a player's going to be able to match against when they try and spell words out we'll match those words so I'm going to start off by just adding all the assets for our word into the game so in assets uh, catalog here I'll go ahead and just drag in all the artwork from the GFX folder drag all those into there Boom. And you see there are various letter tiles. And the reason I've done them all as, as pictures is because there's a sort of slight embossing effect on the letters. Uh, there's a wood grain effect on the tiles. It adds a little bit more color to the design. There is a blank one there, which we're not really gonna use in this game, apart from a placeholder. But it's there for you to go ahead and customize in the future to add your own language characters in there. Um, you know, my wife is Hungarian, they have all sorts of fascinating vowels um, which you can spell out with the black tile later on if you want to. It's just Times New Roman. Anyway, there's our assets. So that's our stuff, and for the two word files, which is start.txt and words.txt, just drag those into the project navigator as loose files and add them to the target like that. And that's all our resources. Um, so we're going to start by making a, a really simple layout where we'll have our switcheroo logo, which is this thing here. Boom, that thing. Switcheroo logo, then a bit of space, then the player's active word tiles, the words are spelling from uh, right now. Uh, then more space, and then the tray, the 10 tiles that can swap in and out to spell new words. Uh, questions that I publish assets, assets which I did, scroll up and find us a uh, link uh, further up ahead. Uh, Edgardo, did I buy them? No, I just drew them in Photoshop. Um, I'm sorry, I have no drawing skills. Um, so if you hate the assets, by all means, redraw them on your own time. Uh, I am not an artist. <laughs> I am a developer. Anyway, um, we're going to make our simple layout over here in Content View. And let's try and make some space. So you see we have this text thing going on here with our frame and so forth. I'm going to scrap that for now and replace it with our basic layout. So I'll say rather than that text, we have a V stack. V stack here. 
the stack with a spacing of uh, 20 points like that. So a little bit of space between our rows and our stuff. Uh, and inside there, we're going to uh, Pabalunia, we have this that's already posted further up the way. Just scroll up and you'll find them. Uh, they're right there already posted in the chat log. Um, there's our, our VStack to control the stuff in our, our view. I'll start by saying there is an image of Switcheroo. That's our logo file, which you already have from the assets, which hopefully you're now finding in the chat log. Uh, I've got some padding around it so it doesn't go quite edge to edge like that. Then we'll add a spacer so we can uh, have a bit of gap between that and the rest of the stuff. Then we'll put our active letters there. Then another spacer. Then our letter tray. So these will be the four letters of spelling right now. Uh, dare, whatever it is. Uh, and below that letter tray will be the ten alternative letters they can drag and drop to make new four-letter words. Uh, now on iOS, by default, you have a sort of screen size to work with because of course the iPhone size is, is fixed as is the iPad and watch and, and TV. But on Mac OS, these windows are resizable. So by default, the window we can, will fit this content precisely or can be stretched if you allow it to be. In our instance, we want an exact fixed window size designed for our game to look exactly right. So we're gonna say that our VStack, our main VStack has a frame with a width 1024 and a height 768. Is that, it's not SVGA, was it? Is that XGA? I lost track. Back in the late 90s, that was like a resolution name. Uh, anyway, that's the frame of our whole window. And we're also gonna say this thing has a background picture. We'll do, oops, dot background in lowercase. And I'll say it has image of our background picture, which is a sort of scratched metal effect. Uh, oops, Daisy, go on, indent that please. Indent, there we go. Sort of a scratch metal effect to have behind our stuff. Uh, now we should see if I run that code now, uh, I have a little build and run. So, boom, there is our sort of default window. As you can see, it's a Mac OS window, so you can drag it around, you can close, minimize, uh, full screen if you want to. Um, that all works out, out of the box. Um, what you can do is you can. Um, customize this if you want to because we have this window and it's made for us by the app delegate inside app delegate.swift and there's code here to let you customize the way um, the window looks you can see this thing is it's had a title it can be closed it can be miniaturized it can be uh, resized and so forth um, so you could say listen I, I don't want to have a title to this thing so there's no bar at top at all and when you do that, that sort of gray bar, this thing here is going to go away. If I run it again without um, the title thing in there, we should see, hopefully, boom. It's now a fixed size window with no bar across it anymore, uh, which works really well. Of course, it's, it's deeply annoying because um, we now can't move the window um, because we've lost the title bar. Uh, and helpfully, um, macOS has a fairly common uh, UI approach where any part of the window that isn't doing something, that doesn't catch the tap, catch the mouse click, can be made to move the window. So you can drag it from anywhere if you want to. And that's a property in our window. We can just say for our window, uh, like here, we can say uh, window dot is movable by window, oops, Daisy, by window background. Boom. Make that true. Ah, Nancy Trey, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Uh, I'll be dog treats later on. I should say, by the way, um, one of our dogs has had an operation. Um, so you might get to see her in her comedy cone uh, later on. Anyway, I made that true. So I can now grab the window anywhere and move it around, which is a really much more uh, Mac-like way of moving windows, I think. It looks really nice. Anyway, so there's our basic layout here. Um, what we're going to start off with now is sort of filling our, our letters of stuff. How does a letter look on the screen? And you've seen we have all these graphics up here with A, B, C, D, Z, and so forth. And it is Z, by the way, Americans. Um, they're all there already. Um, we could just add those directly to content view. But over time, we're going to add more and more functionality to these things. So they do more. They can be dragged. They have some shadow. When you drop them, things happen and so forth. Uh, and as a result, the best thing to do is really put that into its own Swift UI view. 
keep things really, really nice and small. Uh, Chris, she is, the dog's absolutely fine. She'd reached the age of, the grand old age of two, which in Samoyed years means it's time to have the special operation, which means she'll never be a doggy mummy, sadly. Um, so she's fine, but she's wearing a cone and very annoyed. Anyway, focus. Yes. We're going to take the letter out into its own Swift UI view. So over here, I'm going to say uh, Command N, make a new file, and say Swift UI view, and call this thing letter. One letter in our game, like this. And to start off really, really simple, okay? So if you want to be a letter in our game, what you've got to have is the text string you want to show in the letter, which will be A, B, C, D, E, F, and so forth, up to, as Mark said, Z. Um, that's, it has to have one of those things. Then inside the body, we can immediately convert that text to be an image. Because if they pass us the letter A or B or C and so forth, then we have letter A, letter B, letter C already there inside our asset catalog as images. So you can say uh, here, there's an image of that text. Now I'll give this thing an exact frame. Now you don't really have to say an exact frame, but here it makes sure the whole thing is neatly clickable. Uh, so I'll say this thing has a width of 90 and a height of 130, like that. There's an exactly sized image of the text they've chosen to use, like that. Uh, and down below, uh, the letter here, I'll say you default to the text of A. If I run that back in the preview over here, we should see our little A graphic being displayed on the right. Well, that's happening. Rust says, have I seen Kilo Loco's video? Uh, you mean any of them or his newest one where he's got an amazing job? <laughs> yes, I have. I do watch Kilo's work. He's wonderful. I love Kilo so much. I need to get me a coding passionate hoodie. Kilo, if you're listening, give me a hoodie. Come on, you can see I'm on brand. I promote my friends. Come on, help me out. Give me a hoodie, man. Keep me warm. I'm living in the UK. It's cold here. <laughs> anyway, so there you can see. There's our A graphic right there um, looking very nice on the screen. And I can use that to make our tiles on the screen. So over here in content view, uh, we have these active letters. I'm gonna say this thing here, zoom out slightly so we can see our preview slightly bigger, there we go. This thing here isn't just a, a comment of active letters, it's actually going to be, oh, Rick, that is super kind. Thank you very, very much. That's really generous. That's like a whole bag of dog treats right there. Um, that's awfully kind, thank you so much. Anyway, active letters. Uh, I'm going to say, we want to have these tiles here, four of them across the way. I'll say uh, there's going to be a H stack to do that. And we'll count uh, for each uh, zero up to less than four. Number in. Uh, letter, and we'll just do text A again. So we can see A, 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 A across the way like that. Russ, yes, I did watch his job at Bird. It's a wonderful thing. His commute is quite long, but it sounds like he's really fitting in. And he'll use the commute wisely by the sounds of it. Anyway, there is our, our uh, main active letter tiles to choose from to play the game. The next step is we want to have this tray at the bottom with 10 other letters they can drag around and work with. So after this space here, we have this letter tray comment. I'm going to say there is another H stack, and this time for each zero uh, up to less than 10 number in, we'll say letter text A, like that. So same thing again, but now 10 of them. We should see all being well, boom. Four here for active letters to choose from, plus 10 below. Now, of course, we don't just want A everywhere, because that would be uh, a game about screaming. Now, this is the game of 2019. Ah, that's the entire game, we're done, we're finished. <laughs> anyway, um, what we want to do is instead uh, show them a starting word up here in the active letters. Like your starting word's going to be lace or dare, or um, time, or in Arya's case, bite. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, a starting word. Now these words have been chosen as being fairly easy to spell from. They're not like, you know, a quip with a Q-U, which is hard to get anywhere from. Um, but they're fairly easy to get from there to somewhere else. Now, what we want to do is load that thing into, ah, question from Dennis, good question from Dennis. How do spaces work? So spaces, in a VStack will automatically take up all available free space. Let's go ahead and go scream, uh, uh, scream, sorry, thank you, that con uh, They'll stretch up the, 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 all the space, they'll fill up all every space they have, pushing everything else to one side. And helpfully, um, you can um, 
have more than one spacer to subdivide stuff. You can have spacer spacer to have two thirds here, then one third later on. Um, they're very flexible things. And actually, folks don't realize this. You can actually just say some spacer dot frame width or height and give them the exact size you want to um, have to have fixed size spaces. So um, they're really helpful. Uh, Chris Song asks, why zero up to lesson 10 and not zero through nine? Um, because one works and one doesn't. If you want to know the answer, Chris, uh, here, if I just do dot there and press build, oops, today's build, um, this will no longer build. Yeah, bang. Um, now, the reason is, it's actually in today's 100 Days of Swift um, Consolidation Day. It's in there. I haven't published it yet because I'm obviously busy talking to you folks. Um, but if you do for each, um, you'll see, boom, data range int is what it accepts. And a range int is one of these things zero up to less than four. That is there a range int. That is not a range int. That is a different type, very similar, called a closed range int. And they support one, not the other. So if you want to do a for each, you've got to use that style, not the other style. That's why. Uh, Plano asks, can I give space spaces a minimum value? Of course you can. You can give them any kind of frame you like and they all work. Anyway, focus here. We want to load up this start.txt file here into a, uh, a nice set or an array of data to work with. Uh, uh, so we can pick one of these words and give it to the player to work with. Later on, we're also going to load this words TXT, all the possible words that are four letters long they can actually spell, like I, and exit, and exam, and use, and so forth here. Um, so we have to have those things in our thing as well. So we have two files, both of which contain arrays of words, where each word is one aligned by itself. So we're gonna write some code to make loading those easier. Make an extension, you know I love extensions so much. I'll press Command N and choose a new Swift file. And I'll name this thing bundle, bundle, dash word loading. An extension for loading these kinds of files from our um, project here. Rust, see, it's a macOS app because it's much easier to run. Anyway, this thing is going to be an extension on all bundles. I'll add a method here called words from a file name string. And we'll return a set of strings, not an array, a set for speed reasons. Because we're going to have how many files are in this words thing here? There are, they have two and a half thousand words a player can spell. Uh, as forty words, Dennis. Thank you very much. It's awfully kind of you. Um, Two thousand words right here to choose from. And if we'd use an array, we said, "Hey, array, do you contain the word?" Uh, let's have a look. Do you contain the word "zany"? It would start at uh, question uh, word one here. A bed, a bet. No, 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 no. Scroll. No, 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 no. Oh, there it is. And it'd have to search through two and a half thousand words to find the thing does not exist inside an array. Whereas with a set, it's uh, what's called a linear type operation. It's basically uh, sorry, constant, constant operation. It's O1. It's immediate. You say, do you contain zany? Yes, I do. No, I don't. Instantly. So a set's a much better idea here. So what we're going to say in here is first get the URL from our bundle where this file exists. So I'll say, I'll say guard that URL equals bundle dot main dot URL. And we want the for resource with extension option. The resource should be the file name they asked for. The extension will just be nil. And if that fails, if we can't find the file we're asking for, I am totally going to do a fatal error here. Uh, can't find file name. Because this should never, ever happen. Never happen. You know, if, if they have asked for a file, if we've asked for a file, it doesn't exist, bang, just crash. It's a program error. Don't do it. When we have that, we'll load that into a string. We'll say uh, guard let contents equals try question mark string contents of that URL. And if that fails, if we can't load this thing, then fatal error, I uh, can't load the file name. Boom. If we're here, it means we've found the file in our bundle, we've loaded it into a string. Now we can do uh, our contents dot components separated by, there we go, backslash n, get one item per line. That'll give us an array back. We can convert that to a set 
we'll just set that thing and then return that. So split the uh, array of uh, words by, sorry, split the string into an array of words by a new line, then make it into a set for faster loading. So this thing can now be used to load words.txt and start.txt for use in our application. Uh, Sergey asks, why do I use static instant extension for this type? I mean main bundle. Oh, I see. Yeah, sorry, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that might cause problems now. Uh, let, let's just do file URL. You are absolutely correct. That's a really important point. I'm already making an extension on bundle here. I shouldn't have to use bundle.main.whatever. Just using uh, URL directly is fine. Thank you, Sergey. Good catch. Uh, these questions are great. <laughs> anyway, we now have this thing to load these two files. Uh, so we can go ahead and use that. Now, so what we're going to say is, uh, in content view, we can now use that extension twice. Once to um, load the words.txt and once to load the start.txt. So hopefully, if I go to content view, where are we? Uh, there we go. Boom. Yeah, okay. So here, I can go ahead and load the files using our extension. I'll say uh, let, oops, indent it, let allowed words equals bundle.main.words. Is it going to work? There we go. From string words.txt. Then uh, let's do start words. It's going to be, I think it was start.txt. Start.txt, yeah. Okay, cool. So hopefully now I can run the code. It won't do anything, but at least it won't crash. If it does crash, it means we've kind of screwed up somewhere along the way, and it'll tell us why. Let's find out. I have a drink. Oh. It has not crashed. That's a good thing. Okay. So now we have these two files to work with. Uh, our next job is to, uh, when the game starts, give the player a random word. Dare. Hats. Zany. Um, something from the start list, obviously. Something that's actually quite easy. These are all fairly easy words to work with. So we want to try and have an array of letters for the player to work with. And we also want to pick out 10 random letters to have in this tray down here. So it's not just ah all the way, it's something more meaningful. So we'll have our um, uh, active letters array, the ones we're spelling with right now, and our tray below. Uh, how do I read in Russian? Uh, <laughs> uh, Cyrillic is used in many parts of the world, you know. I, I, I do try and be a, a man of the world. Anyway, um, so we're going to say we have some state. We'll say there is at state var active letters, the ones are spelling with right now. And by default, this will be a string array repeating blank for now four times. So it'll be blank, 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 start off with. Then at state var tray, the 10 at the bottom, is going to be the same thing. A string array repeating blank count 10 times. So we have four blank tiles in our, our top thing here and 10 in the tray below. So now picking the active letters is as simple as just sort of saying, hey, um, give me a random word from our start words. But filling the tray is more complex because we want a random letter to go into the tray. And we don't really want a truly random letter because um, some letters like Q or X are very unwelcome in word games. They're very hard to use. Uh, so we want to include them occasionally, but not commonly. So what we're going to do is we're going to say um, there's a new method down here called uh, func random letter returns a string. And this is going to say, uh, here's a big old string of all possible letters. This is sort of a lazy way of doing it. Here's all possible letters, A through Z. Uh, and we're going to pick a random one of the letters and make it into a string. So we can say, as a string of, ready for this, uh, A, B, uh, with caps on please, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. I have done the alphabet successfully, hooray. <laughs> anyway, um, those are all letters you want to choose from in our thing. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and call random element on that directly, on the string directly. And if that fails, return E. So that will send back one random letter from our string, hopefully. Did I miss any letters off? I don't think so. 
I'm sure someone in the chat will tell me shortly if I've missed off a key letter. Uh, now, what we want to do, of course, is balance it in terms of frequency. Ah, Guitar iPod says, Content of do not match any available overloads. So watch out, because Sergey pointed out that I uh, incorrectly used um, bundle.main.url here. I rename that to be file URL, and that to be URL. So we have to want to load the file URL, not the, the method URL. That would be, that'd be strange. Um, anyway, so um, here, we're going to cheat slightly and make some of these letters more common than other letters out there. So we get more A's than B's, for example. We can say, listen, I want to have, let's say there are five A's. And then let's do two B's and two C's and uh, let's do four D's. And E, of course, is really important. I'll say there are uh, let's do six of those. Uh, F isn't very common. Uh, leave that out. Let's have two G's. Let's have uh, maybe three I's. Uh, one J is probably fine. One K is fine. Let's have a couple of L's or three L's. Let's have lots of M's. We like M's. And N's are good too. Let's have four of those things. Uh, o will have four O's. Uh, three P's, one Q, uh, let's do three more R's, I have four R's in total, let's do four S's, like that, and then four T's, oops, crazy, T, and then one more W, and boom, that'll do. So, um, what'll happen is, it'll choose a random letter from that string, and it'll be a character that comes back, G, O, E, whatever, um, and... Because I've added more E's than W's or X's or Z's, um, the likelihood of getting an E will be higher because there's more to choose from. Now, as um, someone asked, and Baz is very helpfully answered, thank you, Baz, um, when you do random element on a string, you get one random character instance back. And we want to send back a string, not a character. So I sort of stringify the return value from that and send that back. So when we call random letter, we will now get one random letter <clears throat> balanced more towards E's and A's and M's and so forth and, and Q's and so forth. Um, so we can now do random letters, which is nice. We can now use that inside a new method called start game. So I'll say start game. And this is going to go ahead and pick out a random letter for the player to work with. That's the four letters in the middle. So I'll say uh, let new word equals our start words, which is a set, dot random element. And if that fails, use cape or dare or bite whatever it is um, so just choose something from there it's a random word and we want to put that into our string array this thing up here a string array where we need to have uh, c a p e or d a r e or similar <clears throat> Ah, Slopper2 asks, why not force unwrap this? You're absolutely right. Honestly, if someone wrote that in code review for me, I'd be like, yes, that's fine. But I am totally aware many, many teams hate that and will fight bitterly against force unwraps, even in places like that, where it's clearly valid. So, you know, I'm not going to start a fight. <laughs> anyway, no, Ori is, is fine. Anyway, we want to turn this thing into an array of strings. And we can do that by saying active letters equals our new word dot map string dot init. So convert that single word into an array of strings like that. Uh, for our tray, we want 10 random letters. So we'll say that tray, oh, lowercase, that tray is uh, 1 through 10 dot map. Ignoring the value coming in, self dot random letter. Random letter. Boom. Baz, yes, exactly. That's exactly correct. It would never fail. Uh, it will always succeed. Uh, and it's one of those things where, you know, I see it all the time. People argue about it, and I haven't really got the patience for it. I'm happy to go along with it, whatever one wants. But realistically, it's never going to fail. If you join a team where they don't mind it, go for it. If they do hate it, don't start a fight, it's not worth it, there are bigger things to worry about. And the same is true for things like case iterable enums. Getting a random element from the all values thing, it's always going to work. Otherwise, the enum has no values somehow. Um, so if you're doing that on a case iterable enum, then I would force and wrap it, but don't start a fight. We're not here for this. We're, we're here for bigger problems, right? Not just here about arguing about force and wraps all day. Anyway, so now Act Letters contains four random letters, and Trey contains ten random letters. 
What we want to do is call this array when our game starts. So as soon as the game starts, go ahead and call start game. And we can do that by saying uh, dot on appear for the main vstack we have, perform start game. So call that immediately as soon as this main view appears. Now, ultimately, even with all that work, we're still going to have an array of ah. This is the 2019 game of screaming still because we haven't actually used letters anywhere. We still have letter text A, letter text A absolutely everywhere. Uh, so to fix that, we're going to go ahead and say, rather than just using text A everywhere, uh, we can say instead, this letter should be self.active letters, that number. So use the correct letter from our letters array rather than just A. And now you can see sale pops in or lace appeared briefly as well. And then down here, for the letter, we can do uh, self, self dot tray number like that. So it leaves the correct thing from there as well, all being well. Boom. So we have dent and lots of, oh, an X, lovely. Anyway, <laughs> so you can see now uh, at least our stuff's kind of coming together. Okay, so that's our basic layout done. How are we doing for time? Oh, way over. This is going to be a long one, folks. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, our next job is to make these letters be draggable. So you can drag the letters around and do interesting things with them. Um, so to do that, I'm going to go to the letter over here and make these letters draggable. Now, if you've been following um, the 100 Days of Swift UI, which I hope you have because it's beautiful, um, you'll know how to do this already. It's actually fairly straightforward in Swift UI. We start by adding some state to our view. We'll do at state var drag amount equal to cg size dot zero. Give me a random element, uh, or give me a zero drag amount, sorry, um, by default for this view. And we can then use that to offset the letter by moving it around the screen. We'll say uh, dot offset by drag amount. So when drag amount changes, move the uh, letter by that much on the screen. We'll also say that every letter had attached to it a gesture, which is going to be, with a bit of indenting, a drag gesture, like that. Uh, now, this thing has two modifiers we care about. Uh, one is on changed. When they've moved the drag slightly, what do you want to do? Another is uh, on ended. The indents really annoy me in this thing sometimes. Anyway, on ended. Now, when we're changing a drag, we're just moving this thing around. Uh, all we're going to do is say, uh, get the movement of our gesture and use that to uh, offset our letter. Now, cunningly, um, what we want to do really is work in the global space. Don't think about where the letter is relative to the letter. Think about where it is relative to the whole screen. Uh, and we do that in two ways. The first way is by saying to our drag gesture that it has a coordinate space of dot global. Give me the global coordinates to work with. The second way really annoys me a little bit is that we have to flip the Y, the Y coordinates, because it's measuring zero as the bottom side of the screen, not the top of the screen. Um, so we've got to flip it around. So we'll say that self dot drag amount in on change is CG size with the width being the value that got passed in, which would be $0, the drag amount, which is translation, dot width. So when you move it around, move our x by that amount. For the height, we'll flip the y. Like I said, turn it around, so top is the bottom. Top is the 0, and bottom is not. So how does it say minus $0, dot translation, dot height, like that. So as they drag around the screen, update their position. And when we're ended, when we release our finger from the drag, we'll just say self dot drag amount is dot zero. Reset the uh, thing like that. Ah, so exploit, thank you very much. I'm glad you're enjoying the 100 days program. It's a lot of work, <laughs> but I'm enjoying making it ultimately. So when they release their finger, snap it back to the center of the screen again so they can drag it around some more. Now, if I have not screwed up too much, which there's always scope for that. Over here, I've got to have underscore in here. There you go. A tiny scrub, I can live with that. If I haven't scrubbed too much, that should actually work already. Like the first step towards working. Let's find out. Yep, command R, have some wine. Mm. 
Ah, no, it has not worked. Okay, that means I have screwed up something along the way. Question is, what did I screw up? Yeah, that is not working at all. Um, bear with me, folks. Let me just try and unscrew my uh, <laughs> uh, my uh, game. Um, to look in letter. Da -da, offset by that amount. Yes, that looks good. Add the offset there. Do a gesture. Coordinate space. Uh, yes, that's correct. On change is that. On end is that. Huh. Looks correct. Why are you not actually working, you horror? We'll just try again. Yeah, it's definitely not working. I don't think it's the window interfering with it. Let me just disable the window dragging just in case that is indeed interfering with it. I don't think it is, but there's no harm uh, being sure on that one. Uh, so I think, where is it? Can I have it back, please? Oh, it's on the wrong screen, that's why. Ah, so it, it now works, it's now on the wrong screen. Yeah, the window is actually can get confused with our drag, it looks like, which is a bit annoying. But anyway, it seems, it seems happier now. Now I've removed the window drag. Um, yeah, that's annoying. I, I like the window drag thing, for, personally. I think it looks good. Um, anyway, so... We now have our um, thing looking quite nice. Um, but there's a slight hiccup, which you notice occasionally, which is that if I grab this like N and go over here, you can see it looks really nice. If I drag the D and go under, you see it goes under the E, which is like quite confusing, actually. You kind of want the thing you're dragging um, to always be on the top. Uh, and we can do that in SwiftUI actually fairly easily because uh, in SwiftUI we have the concept of uh, a Z index, how high and depth perception wise, something should be drawn on the screen. Um, so we can say to our letter that you have a Z index value. And we'll say, if the drag amount is currently zero, then use no Z index. So if we're not dragging at all, be the, the sort of base point of Z index. Otherwise use one. So if it's being dragged anywhere, give it a Z index of one. Like that. So hopefully now we should find we can go over all that's like that, uh, almost. Not quite at the bottom there, but that's good enough. So you see it looks nice. Okay. So you'll see also we can drag these behind there. That is not good either. Um, that's because Z index only applies to the container it's inside. Fortunately, in this game, it's not a problem because we don't want to drag these letters ever. These shouldn't be draggable. They're not designed to be draggable. They're designed to be dragged from here to there, but not from there to here. So we can disable dragging for those things in our content view. Uh, up here, we have our letter tiles here. I can say dot allows hit testing is false. Disable tapping on these buttons. So there's still buttons, they still have activities behind them and so forth, but don't allow these things to be moved around. So now, hopefully, I can drag the tiles around, which is a, a good thing, but I can't drag the active letters around, which would be a bad thing. Yeah, these are now fixed, good. I can drag these up to there, which is great. Okay, so far, this has been pretty easy. The next part is more challenging, because you want to be able to say, uh, as they're dragging around, uh, is this a good place to drop? Like, you know, here we have an R. I should drag the R over the S. Yes, it's good. I can drop that to make rail, for example, but I couldn't choose uh, K like that. It's not a word, K L spelled with L-E, not I-L. Um, so we don't want to do that. So we have to be careful here, we handle this to say, hey, your drag is good, or it's bad, or it's unknown. And we can represent that with an enum. So I'll go into letter, good places any, quite frankly, and say there's an enum called drag state. We'll do case unknown, case good, and case bad. Uh, the three possible cases, of course. Um, and we're going to say it by default, letters have a unknown drag state. Now, when they start dragging them, they're moving somewhere like that. Conrad, thank you very much. NS Screencast. <laughs> anyway, um, by default, letters have a, an unknown drag state. We'll just start moving them. It's not good, not bad, just unknown. So we'll say uh, our letter has at state, var drag state is drag state dot unknown boom unknown drag state by default and what I want to do is try and convert that into some sort of color 
so we can give some feedback on the screen, is this drag good, bad, or unknown? And we can do that with a computed property. Down here, below the body for our letter, we're gonna say var drag color returns a color. A little bit lower, there we go. And we'll say uh, switch on drag state. If drag state is dot unknown, we'll return dot black. If the drag state is dot good, we'll return dot green. And if the case is dot bad, we'll return dot red. So it's gonna return black, green, or red, depending on the current drag state, like that. And we can now apply that to our buttons up here. We can say this thing has an offset, has Z index, but it also has a shadow. And for the color, I'll use our drag color, which will be again, black, green, or red. And for the radius, how much of this color to apply, it really depends if they're dragging it or not. So we can say, well, is drag amount zero or not? If it is, use no radius, no shadow. If it isn't, if they're dragging it right now, use 10 points of drag around it. Now, hopefully if I run that, we should see some results. Let's find out. Boom. So if you look, I'm sure you can see on the screen, there's a little nice little black shadow around our buttons now as we drag them around. There we go, you can start to see over here in this lighter part perhaps. Uh, it's kind of good, it's a bit faint. Um, and one of the nice things you can do with Swift UI is because of the way modifiers work, which again has been covered in 100 days of Swift UI, um, which is free online, so I'll link it in the chat thing. <laughs> um, you can apply modifiers multiple times. So you can say, hey, that shadow isn't good enough. I wanna have a shadow and then another shadow. And it'll work exactly the same. And it basically doubles up the shadow effect now. It shadows the shadow. Um, so you get an extra strong shadow now. Boom, look at that. Nice, chunky, thick shadow now, yeah. Um, yeah, so you can apply modifiers as often as you need, whenever you want. It's really, really cool. Anyway. Now for the challenging part, the really challenging part. We want to know when they drag this, uh, what should we do, G. G here spells gill, like a fish gill. Um, we want to know, yes, that is a good drop. Yes, that is correct thing to do. Uh, and the, the challenge here in Swift UI terms is knowing where they drop the letter. Because if we, if we drop it, you know, we drop here, WTLL is not a word, right? Wilt's a word, till's a word, but WTLL is not a word. So we've got to know where they dragged it, what they drag it over. And this is surprisingly challenging in Swift UI. If you think in UI kit term, you'd say, you know, um, look at where they're dragging, look what's below it, is it this button? Yes, do that, and so forth. It'd be pretty straightforward. Uh, in Swift UI, we don't have that option. We can't say, yeah, give me an array of all the buttons at this location. Not a thing you can do. So we're going to take an interesting workaround to make this work really nicely. If we go to our uh, content view again here, this is where we make our buttons. And uh, below allows hit testing, I'm gonna add dot overlay color dot red. Give me a red overlay over the active letter buttons. And what we'll see is, boom, we get red, 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 red. At exactly the same positions and same sizes as the views beneath them. That's a wonderful feature of uh, Swift UI. Uh, auto, the overlays automatically match the size of the thing below them, which is really, really helpful. We can use that to create a new overlay that will track where our buttons are. So what we're gonna do is we'll make a new state property up here, at state. And this is gonna track as a variable, it's gonna track uh, all the frames of the buttons we want to work with which button we have, you know, the first, second, third, or fourth. So we'll call this thing button frames. And by default, it'll be a CG rect array, repeating, uh, repeating dot zero count four times. So there are four items inside our array. And I just realized before one of the YouTube lovely hater commenters gets in touch, yes, by all means, mark these as private variables. Private bar, private bar, private bar. I love YouTube commenters so much. They're really lovely. Let's take private var, private var, private var. There we go. Let's avoid the trolls today. Hey, speaking of nice YouTubers, you're all here. You can go ahead and like this video now, can't you? Because I'm working really hard for you. 
I'm not taking any money from you apart from the nice folks leaving me dog treats, which is very, very kind of you. Um, I would appreciate it very much if you left a like in the video now. If you're enjoying this video, see what we're making, leave a like in the video now, uh, and it helps other folks find this in the future. So please like the video, help me out, it helps me make more Switzerland Sundays videos in the future. Anyway, advert over. What I'm going to say is, for our overlay here, not color red. Instead, we're going to use a clear color. Put nothing there, right? So we'll see our regular letter tile shine through, as if there's nothing there. If it's in updates, come on, resume, you can do it. It's thinking very hard and slowly, but there we go. So I let the letter tile just shine through like before, but it's now an invisible overlay. The correct width and height and position of that button right there over S-A-N-D, it's right there. And color.clear is a view like any other kind of view, which means we can attach modifiers to it. We can say color.clear itself has an on appear modifier attached to it. So when this overlay is shown, what should we do? And we can say is uh, wrap this thing, wrap that entire on appear, the entire overlay in fact, inside a, uh, a geometry reader. Now, we haven't covered these in 100 days yet because they're, they're pretty advanced. They're, they're going to come later on. Uh, they let us uh, track the position and size of things inside the global space. We can say, hey, um, how big are you or where are you? What's your X? What's your Y? And so forth. And manipulate those as much as we want to. It's really, really nice. So we can say is our overlay here has a geometry reader coming in right like this and when that thing comes in it'll pass us a parameter called geo or in our case geo the geometry to use where you are on the screen and so forth like that so our overlay now is a geometry reader which inside it is the color clear and when that appears do something this will all make sense shortly i realize this is pretty hardcore stuff but it's gonna make sense shortly the overlay for our view is this box right here. It's invisible, it's color clear, but it's inside a geometry reader, which lets us know its position in the space of our game. And we can use that to stash away that position inside our button frames array. We can say here in the one up here, self, uh, self dot button frames, our number, is that geo, that thing passing by the geometry reader, dot frame in global like that so stash away where this thing is going to be uh oh, it's very angry oh dot global sorry dot global boom give me the global position of this view right now and that means our array when it finishes will know exactly where these four buttons are it'll say well button zero is this rect button one this rect button two is rect button three that rect so our ray now will know exactly where all our drop zones are. And we can now use that. We can say, hey, when a button's been dropped, when a tile's been dropped, what was it dropped over? And we'll report back, yeah, it's a good drop, or it's a bad drop, or it's an unknown drop. So let's scroll down here in content view, add a new method down here called letter moved. This will be called whenever you drag around, that on change thing's being run, you're dragging it around, call this thing, um, and it will call it and say, yeah, it's a good drop or bad drop. So let's let move to uh, location, which would be a CG point, mm, CG point, with the letter of string. What letter was moved? Was it an M, was it an L, and so forth. So we can try spelling the new word. And it will return, return, hopefully, come on, there we go, a drag state. Was it a good drag or a bad drag or an unknown drag? Like that. So what we're going to say is try and find which of our drop zones contains that location. Which of our buttons are they moving over right now? Uh, and Swift would say if let match equals our button frames array dot first index the first item position where that item contains the location, like that. So find us the first drop zone 
that contains the drag location. Now say, yeah, drop zone zero, or drop zone two, or none of them. If it's none of them, great. Else, uh, we'll just go ahead and return dot unknown. It's a bad drag, or an unknown drag. If we're here, it means uh, the, they're trying to drag a letter over one of our actual drop zones. What do we think of this move? Now, match will contain which drop zone they're over. Is it this one, this one, this one, or this one? So our first check will be uh, in here. If our active letters at that match already is that letter, they try and drop a H onto a H, we will immediately return dot bad. Like, otherwise, the game's just too easy. You're just spelling hats, 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 and so forth, right? That's not much fun. If we're after that, it means it's a new letter. They try to put an M in place of the H to make mats. Do we like that or not? And we can decide we'd like that by saying, first, get a new variable called test letters equal to our active letters. Get a copy of our current letter array. Replace test letters match with their letter. So they drag M over index zero, replace test letters index zero with M. So it's not hats, it's now mats. We've got a new word to work with. We can then turn that array into a regular string by saying let test word equals the string form of test letters dot joined. Uh, joined, boom. That's our word there right now. So it'll say mats. Is mats a good word or not? Well, we can find out by saying if allowed words, scroll down, allowed words dot contains that test word, then awesome, return dot good, else return dot bad. Now this thing here, again, it's a, uh, a constant time operation. It's really, really fast on sets. Doesn't matter if you have 1,000 words, 10,000 words, you know, or a, a million words you have to, it's still lightning fast, which is why we're using sets. We don't want this thing to be um, running an array contained as we're dragging a thing around it, which is too viciously slow, uh, even on uh, modern Mac. So we want to use a set for that. It's much, much faster. So now we have a letter move uh, thing here, which will accept location, where is a tile, and letter, M, N, Q, whatever it is, and send back the drag state. Is it a good drop or a bad drop? So now we can use that in our letters here. I'm going to add a new property here, which I'll say is called var unchanged. This will be a closure. So it's going to take a closure here, and the closure will take a CG point, that location, and a string, left the check, and send back a drag state, just like the thing we just wrote. I'll make it optional, so we don't have to provide unless we really, really want to, because our tiles in the middle, they aren't going to move ever. We don't want to worry about those, so it's optional. So it's going to go ahead and call that thing whenever this drag data changed here. So we update drag amount to the new location, and we can now immediately say here, update our drag state to be self.onChanged. Call that closure with our location and our text. If that doesn't work because onChanged wasn't set, just use uh, dot .unknown. There's always a value coming back. Okay. So now the letter knows how to call back something when it's been dragged around. What we want to do now is attach that method, letter moved, this thing here, to our letters. So we have up here, here's our tray. I'll say this thing, letter text, boom, on changed is self.letter moved, like that. Chris Song says, in this case, a really much slower performance. How can then? So, Chris, this is one of the things that's not really an optimization hack. This is a a um, sort of fundamental computing science principle. This is the way sets work. This is why they aren't ordered and why they can't contain duplicates. They're very very fast. Um, uh, so I'm not. I mean, it's, it's in Pro Swift. Sets are in Pro Swift big time. I'm not sure if the particular that particular thing about sets is in there because I kind of assumed. Um, people might have done it already, but you're right. It, uh, but anyway, process is the one you're looking at. Process is full of things like that. So anyway, so hopefully I'll press Command R, and in theory, as I've muffed something up, there we go. There's our muff up right there. Oh, I put text for the unchanged. Whoops, that's a bad idea. I don't like doing that. I like having my um, 
uh, closures after my fixed things. I'm a bit weird like that. Like that. There we go. Boom. Okay, let's try that again. Command R. Hopefully this will work. Let's find out. So this has worked. We'll know because if they drag out, it goes black. Over here, it's green. It likes tor because you can. That's a pattern of tear. That one's red though. C T R E is bad. Coat. Coat's a word. I guess it's like French for coast. I'm not sure. And then court's not a word. Uh, boar's good though. Uh, and cone is good. Uh, and law is good. But C L R E is not. So you can see it's actually coming together quite nicely. Um, the the glowing works perfectly well. The text as you drag around really nicely. Um, now of course we have to now handle the real work, which is the drop. When they drop this thing, we have to actually update the word and, and take some action here. Uh, this requires again a little bit more thinking because um, yes, you want the location they dropped it at and the letter they dropped and so forth, but we also need to know which tile item got moved. Because if they drop that, if they pull a C out of the tile tray and put it onto an active words, it should be removed from the tiles and have a new one put to the end. So we've got to know which item to remove from our tray. So we're going to have a, 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 an extra value being stored in our letter that tells it where it exists in its container. So I'll say um, for letter here. Uh, there is a var index int that is required. So you have to pass in where I exist inside my container. And I'll say down here for our previews, text is A, fine, um, but the index would be just zero, basically a, a non-index like that. Uh, and then we can now use that inside our content view where we make our active letters and make our tray. So here's our text. Da -da -da. I'll say your index is index is number. So index 0, index 1, 2, or 3. And again down here, letter da, 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 index is the number. So 0, oops, 0 through 9. So every letter now knows where it exists inside its container. And this matters because we're going to write a new method now to handle letter drops. And it'll say, I dropped um, letter uh, Q, uh, which was from index 5 onto position 3, for example. And if we like it, if it's a good drop, we can then remove uh, that thing from the tray, which is great. So down here, we'll make a new method called func letter dropped at location CG point again, with a tray index this time, where it came from, and a letter string. Mm, string, boom. This won't return anything, okay? This thing will only be called if it's really a, a a a safe drop. So we'll say in here first which one did they drop it on? We'll do the same thing as before. If let match equals our button frames dot first index uh, where then dot zero dot contains our location. Boom. So if we can find that location, um. Kenneth, by all means, uh, uh, this application ends up being yours. You can do with it whatever you want. <laughs> you can animate these things, pff, fill your boots. I'm already uh, a good 10 minutes over. So uh, yeah, no, not here. Um, so if we found the thing we're matching against, awesome. We will immediately overwrite active letters that match to be the new letter. So it's, it's no longer um, dare, it's care, whatever. We'll then remove from our tray that tray index item. So they drag D from position 4, remove it from the tray now. And append to the tray a new random letter, like that. So we'll get a new one in the tray. There's always 10 letters in there to so keep on going. Now as with unchanged in letter.swift, we have this closure we can call when something's happened. The, the letter doesn't really care what happens. It just says, hey, tell somebody else. Same thing here. We'll say var onended is a closure Take a CG point and an int this time, that's the index, and a string, and returns void. Nothing comes back, like that. And then uh, down in our onended closure here, we're going to say if this is a good drop, if we like this drop, awesome. Go ahead and update it. So if self.drag state is good, then self.onended. Call that closure passing in our location 
and our index and our text like that. And we can now remove this underscore in. So we're now using the value being passed in like that. Okay, so now let us know what to call when they've been dragged and what to call when they've been released to trigger an update of our game. And we can now attach this method in our content view, just like before. We have up here, uh, on change, letter moved, great. We'll add to that uh, on ended self dot letter dropped. So call that method when you're dropped. And hopefully now, this game's actually coming together after 72 minutes. Okay, so we have, I'm gonna turn on the, the window title again so I can see what I'm doing. Um, let's undo this a few times, boom, 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 there we go. So I can drag it around, otherwise it obscures the chat window. So let's have a go. I've got sire, I'm gonna say fire. Yeah, and now we've got de, dire. And then dine. I've got an X, thank you for that. Uh, dime and time and tame and game and so forth. Um, so you can see this game actually works. We now have the ability to drag this around and remake new words. And if you try and make a bad word like A-A-M-E, it just won't have it. You can't do it. It's got to be a valid word, otherwise it just will not have that choice, which is great. So, to make this really a game, to really finish this thing off, um, of course we need some sort of pressure, right? We need to make this thing have some sort of pressure behind it. Um, so we're going to add a score. They get one point for every word they make. Uh, and a time. So there's some deadline pressure to this as well. A bit of, bit of stress to keep them on their toes. Um, and that's done with two new properties in our content view up here. Uh, I'll say we have uh, at state private var, private var, time remaining. And I'll say you've got 100 seconds by default to go as fast as you can. And at state private var score is zero by default. So the, uh, the time remaining and the score will both be label, thing below, label, thing below. Uh, either side of our, our, our logo switcheroo. So we're gonna represent that with a new Swift UI view so we can save and repeat the code again, again, and again. So I'll press Command N, make a new Swift UI view, and choose Swift UI view. And I'll call this thing a game number. Like that. And to be a game number, um, you're gonna have to have the text to show, which will be score or time, and a value integer. 100 seconds remaining, score zero, whatever it is, like that. Then for our uh, body, we'll say we have our text, which will be text, uh, actually it would be restack first, restack first, boom. Then text, our text. Below that, the text of our value, integer, using the font large title. And also, I'm gonna modify the frame here so that these things, I will take up more space. Otherwise, end up being very small and it looks weird on the screen. Send them nicely, we wanna say, hey, use up all the space you need by saying frame uh, max width is dot infinity, like that. So take up as much space you need on screen. Um, to make this thing compile, we have to have a game number here. Um, that's our, our preview. It's empty by default, but of course it requires a text and value to work correctly. So I'll say this thing has text score and value zero. Hopefully if I press resume, it'll build and run on the right. Let's find out. Have a little think. I mean, a slow link. So slow or think. There we go, okay. So we have uh, score zero, which is great, exactly as expected. So we can now use that to show our score information in our content view. Um, that's up here, I'm gonna put uh, on one side the score and over here, boom, um, the time. Uh, Tall Dane asks, how do we say if there's no value solutions possible? That's an interesting computing science problem. Uh, in this case, if we have time, I'll actually add a shortcut to do it um, in a more pleasing way. That actually makes it a better game. Anyway, so we have our image, which are I'll replace that with a H stack. So there's more than one thing in there, like that. And it can contain the game number of, come on, you can do it. 
Nope, my Gabriel is very, very slow. Our <laughs> text is time and the value be our time remaining. And the other type will have game number, given slow motion, let's type it text, score and value is score. So hopefully, we'll have a little think. There we are, time 100, score zero. Okay, Danny, yes, it'll be on GitHub on the Swift on Sunday's repo later on, which I'm sure someone can link in the um, chat window for me, which is nice. So now we have our, our score and our time remaining thing at the top right there. Um, the score's easy enough, right? When when they uh, match a word down here somewhere, we modify our array to include the letter, we remove from the tray, add a new letter to our tray. We'll also say time remaining plus equals one. Give them an extra bit of time to carry on playing. Let's, let's be generous, let's do two. Two's a bit more, right? And then score, one point. So whenever they make a word, they get some bonus time to carry on playing for longer. Um, and they get a little bit of score as well to carry on, encouraging them to get higher and higher scores. And what we really want, of course, is this time to go down and down and down and down as they play. And we can do that with a timer up here. We can say that we have a timer in our game. Let timer equals a timer. And I'm gonna say uh, publish with the comedy conclusion. Oh yeah, I got there and it was actually pretty quickly actually. Um, a timer every one second on the main thread or main queue uh, in common modes connect yourself so start timing away now every one second do something and it'll just publish hello 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 tick tick tick, tick fire 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 um of this timer and what we want to do of course is um modify this game one of our vstack to catch that event when our timer fires, what should we do? So we'll go down to our bottom of our vstack, which is down here where the on appear is. And we'll say, uh, on receive, thank you a lot, thanks a lot, Mark, that's very kind of you. On receive, uh, that timer. Get the, uh, the value in from the timer. And all we'll do is say, if self.time remaining is greater than zero, then self.time remaining minus equals one subtract from one every time the timer fires. We can also use that timer, by the way, to do allows hit testing for our whole VStack based on whether time remaining is greater than zero. So when time remaining is zero, when they're out of time, they can no longer move because of course we don't want the game to carry on being played and so forth. So hopefully now, press Command R again, have a little think. Slow compiles are good for wine drinking. <laughs> ah, boom. There is our timer. 96, 95, 94. Stressful now, you see. Uh, we've got wall here. See, oh, getting on slower. Oh, no. We've got well. No. There we go. Okay. So it's actually coming together quite nicely, I think. Okay, we've got two points. Which is great. Um, to finish up, because we're already a bit over time. To finish up, we're going to add... Um, Two small things to this game make it really more polished. Uh, one of which, Tall Dane said, you know, if you hit a problem where you know you just give up, you've got Q Q Q Q X X X Q or something like that, right? In your in your tray, what do you do? Uh, and what we're going to add is a new button here that lets them reset their tiles. It'll reset these ones here to a new start word and give them ten fresh tray words, uh, tray letters to work with, so they can carry on going. Um, but we're gonna be we're gonna be mean here. We're gonna say, listen, if you do that, you're gonna lose ten points. You really, really don't want to do it. Unless you absolutely have to. Uh, and we actually make this its own type in uh, Swift UI. We'll say it's a new Swift UI view called reset button. Boom. Here, uh, and this thing is going to have um, uh, the button saying, you know, you're reset, reset your letters. You can do, and below it. A warning saying this will cost you ten points. You, you'll you'll lose points if you do this here. Um, so be careful. Um, Chris Song, we're going to fix that real soon now. Don't worry. Um, so when that button's tapped, of course the reset button doesn't care. It wants to just tell somebody else, "Hey, button's been tapped. What do you want to do?" And that's where we'll use a closure, just like in our letters. So we'll say our reset button has uh, a action, which is a closure which will be optional, boom, like that. 
Uh, and we'll say inside here, there is a group. And inside the group is our button with some action. And I'll just call self dot action question mark. Just call that straight away. Pass on the, the button tap to our closure like that. And then for inside the button, uh, we'll say there is a text saying reset letters in a title font with a little bit of padding around it like that. For the button, uh, we're on Mac OS, so by default you can actually get a real push button style, which you don't actually want. Uh, we'll say there's a button style of borderless button style to get sort of edge to edge iOS style button. I'll give this thing uh, a background of color.green, uh, like that. Then give it a clip shape using capsule, get a nice clip shape. And finally, give it the foreground color of dot white, so it's nice and clear on the screen. After the button, and you notice we haven't used a VStack here, because this thing's actually going to be inside a VStack, we'll just use a plain group here. We'll say there is a, a, a text view saying this thing carries a 10 point penalty. Just something I'm really aware before I press that button what's gonna happen. Uh, it's got a font of headlines, so a bit smaller, uh, foreground color of dot white. And I um, mean, it's really clear, I add like a, a, a red shadow, so it's like a glow effect around this with radius five. I'll even do that twice, so it's a really, really bright warning. This will cost you points if you dare to press this button. With that in place, um, we can now add that to our content view, add that reset button between um, the tiles and the tray. However, when they press reset, what should happen? Now, we already have in content view this start game method, which randomizes the word and fills the tray up with random letters, which is exactly what we want. But we also want to deduct some points. So what we're going to do is we're going to rename this to be slightly different. We'll say this thing is actually called reset letters. And it now takes a parameter, deduct points. Bull. Ah, generics, and thank you very much. Very kind. I'm glad you're enjoying it. So this thing will uh, choose a new word, choose new tiles, and so forth. And if deduct points is true, then score minus equals 10 subtract some points when they dare to press this button. Of course, we still have start game being used on a peer. So we're gonna use that. We'll say there's a method called start game, and that will just call reset letters with deduct points set to false. Because obviously the start of the game, it'd be unfair to give them a 10 point penalty already, right? So with that in place, uh, we can now use our button. So we have up here somewhere, uh, here we go. Here's our HStack with our um, letters in right now. What we want to do is say, when you're in there, go ahead and provide our reset button just below it, right here. We'll say there is a reset button. This thing takes a single parameter, which is a closure to run when the button's tapped. We'll say self dot reset letters deduct points is true. Yes, find them for daring to press this button. And hopefully, if I have not screwed anything up, we should now see uh, this thing build. Let's find out. There's always space for screw-ups in live coding. You should know that. Uh, I'll just run the code back. There we go. Oh, yeah. She says it's temple penalty. So there you go. Looking better, I think. So that button now, I think, works. Let's build one of the code. Let's find out. And... Let's try again. Come on, you can do Xcode. Over here, please. There we go. Reset, 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 reset. The score keeps on flying down. We get new words each time, plus new things in our tray. That's working very nicely. Um, the last thing we're going to do, uh, this is obviously just to fix Chris Song's uh, <laughs> worries about our layout. We're going to add a second button under here to shuffle the tray. Um, so they can reorganize a trait and try and find an easier word to spell, give them a bit of a prompt. Um, just like the reset button, this will be a new Swift UI view. Uh, I'll call this thing shuffle tray. And again, it's going to have an action closure it can call when the button's been uh, pressed. So I'll say there is 
Uh, var action, closure, it sends that, takes something and sends something back, like that. Inside there, we'll say there's a H stack with a spacer. So push all the views to the right, so it will be aligned under the bottom right corner of our buttons. And we'll say there is a button with some action. The action will call self.action. Make sure just pass it on to the closure. Inside the button will say there is a text, oops, text saying uh, shuffle tray. Boom. With font headline and padding attached to it like that. For the button style, it's the same as last time. Uh, we'll do button style is borderless button style. Boom. And background is color.red, color.red even. And clip shape is capsule clip shape. For the foreground color, we'll do color dot white. Foreground color, even color dot white. Boom. And critically, like really, really importantly, just for Chris, uh, we're going to add some padding, <laughs> so this thing looks better on the screen. We'll say there's some padding uh, using dot trailing and dot bottom. That looks much better, I'm sure. Uh, and with that in place, we can now go back to our content view and add the last bit of code for our project after our tray, add a shuffle tray view, and pass in self.tray.shuffle, like that. Hopefully, I can build and run. Let's find out. There we go. Okay, so we're saying letters works very nicely. I can drag them around, lane, I can press shuffle tray, and the letters don't change, it's the same letters behind there, but uh, now it just moves them around, making them easier to find. Um, so you can see that is working quite nicely. Okay, and that, I think, finishes our little project. Um, hopefully, you found that really useful. Uh, I think that's the end of our code. Uh, so all being well, you have some questions. Uh, I should say the covers will be on GitHub shortly. I'm going to put it entirely on GitHub. Um, so you can go ahead and download it, modify it, play with it all you want to, add things. Um, add a game over screen, for example. Um, don't let them use duplicate words, for example. I mean, there are so many things you can use with this game to make it better and better and better. Um, but that's over to you now. <laughs> the projects we on GitHub in an hour or two for you to check out and experiment with. Now, that finishes my project. I hope you enjoyed it. That was like a, only an hour and a half, which is pretty fast, actually, comparatively for me. If you have questions about the project or about other non-project related things, so UI stuff, uh, UI kit stuff, you name it. Um, now is a chance to ask. I'll be here for at least another half hour answering your questions. Um, Serha asks, will I upload the video on YouTube? Um, yes, I absolutely will. Ah, oh, hello. Oh, oh, it's Aria. Aria's come. Now you can see uh, our, our poor little doggo here. Um, Aria, come here. Where is she? Come here. She's got, she's got a cone on. Come here, Aria, my baby. She had an operation, um, so she's not terribly happy. Come here, come on, come on, come here, so you can get a treat. You've been given a lot of treat money, dog. People love you very much. Come on. I'm not sure you can see, there you see a little cone. There we go, cone should be this way, sweetheart. Otherwise you have a hard time doing stuff. There we go, you good girl. It's been decorated by my nine-year-old. She's made that a nice little lace thing around it, make it a bit prettier. Um, there you go. You get you get quite a few treats actually because some people have been very very generous with you, dog. Good girl. You're a good dog. And Luna, you're waking very nicely too. Good girl. You're getting better slowly. Oh, hello, Luna. There you go. You get some too. Good girl. Um. Anyway. Um. Questions. Full screen. The camera. You want to see more camera, less uh, code. Come on. Then. Come on. There you go. Good girl. Come on, Ari. Good girl. Come on. Yeah, good girl. There you go. And you can now see the dog in all her coney glory. <laughs> You're a good dog. Yes, you are. You get some mushrooms. You've been, been, been very generous with um, your treats today, you realise. They love you so much. They love you more than Twitter, I think, you know? It's all about the dogs, not the code. Come on, you two. Come on. All right, good girl. There you go. Good dog. Okay. Uh, right, actual questions. Not just dogs, actual questions. Ah, Smongo, thank you very much. Very, very kind of you. Thank you. Um, right. 
Rick Strickland, who very generously gave lots of dog treats, asks, how he's a predicate in a fetch quest? I've seen someone talking about that. I have not managed to try it myself. When I tried it, it didn't work correctly. Uh, it didn't work at all, in fact. So I was very disappointed by it. I thought it would work out of the box, and it did not. I have seen some folks thinking they have a solution for that. Um, so I have to investigate that further. But right now, to the best of my knowledge, you can't. Um, so I have to do some more research. And I do want to know how, because it's really, really important. That's a really important missing piece in the core data uh, question. Uh, if Z is Z, how do you pronounce zebra? Obviously, zebra. Lol, no, zebra. Um, we pronounce zebra. We don't say zebra, it's zebra. Um, make a coding hut, sweet. Um, I would love to do a coding hut one day. Hold a, an iOS coding conference in Nevada and uh, let me know. Um, the True Sent Me asks, when do we need the underscore in? Um, so we need the underscore in for our letters. Let's go back to the code again. The dog's wandered off again. Let's go back to the code again. And find letter here. So this thing on changed and on ended, use the value coming in. That's dollar zero here and here. Uh, and if you don't use those things as these anonymous argument names, um, then you have to accept the value coming in instead. You say like, you know, value in, and then used value dot translation here and also here and here um, that's fine if you don't intend to use the value because originally we weren't using it we were using like originally we had just that for on ended we're not using it at all here we can't ignore the value coming in we've got to say value in and use it somehow or underscore in i know there's a value coming in i don't care there's a value coming in just discard it and move on um, so you've got to use it in that kind of place there Mark, that's very generous. Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, folks, um, Mark has a book on Swift UI. Uh, Mark, if you want to post a link in the chat channel to the uh, your book to let folks check it out. It's a pictorial guide through, I think, all, if not all, then the vast majority of Swift UI views. Um, so his book is very good. I bought it like day one. Um, so recommended. Check it out. Yeah, Mark, go ahead and post a link in the chat thing, and I'll, I'll um, get it approved. Anyway. Questions. Da, 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 da. So, um, uh, so as you can see, uh, so Gantry was asking, will the properties be recreated in the timer resetting itself? Um, timers are no. If I go to the timer again over here, uh, da, 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 up here, timer. Um, this thing. Um, that's useless. Thank you very much. There we go, timer. You'll see it's a class. Um, so it won't actually be recreated automatically. It'll stay as it is. Uh, as you can see, in fact, every time we drag these things around, it's recreating the body for us anyway. So um, it is not recreating the timer at all. As you can see, it doesn't do that. It might have to realize it isn't the case. So if you are, it's clever. Who knew? <laughs> uh, Rahul, is it hard to make something handle VPN? I have never done it. I have no idea. Not the first clue. I would get some extreme... Uh, security advice before you go near thinking about VPN stuff. Be very careful. Uh, it's jumping around, sorry. Uh, did... Uh, questions all over the place. Uh, Donny. Donny. The Donny, come on. Um, hey, Donny. Um, should I start learning iOS with Swift UI or UI Kit? I have a whole page for that, Donny. I've got a whole page right for that. Um, and uh, ah, you're answering yourself. That's cheeky. Get your own YouTube channel. <laughs> you, you cheeky little YouTube thief, you, Donny. Um, I have a whole um, page on my site dedicated to that exact question, and I'll try and give you the link now. So here is Swift UI by example, which is like 400 pages of Swift UI Q and A. Ah, Mark, thank you very much. That's the link there. Go and grab Mark Moykin's book. Um, that'd be great. Anyway. Um, ba -da -da -da. Here, answering the big questions, should you learn Swift UI, UI Kit, or both? Boom. Read this. I explain the problems behind going all Swift UI right now. Um, and I make it clear, I think, immediately somewhere. I, you know, here we are. I, I absolutely love Swift UI. It's extremely, extremely clever and it's got a really, really bright future. Um, but right now, you need to learn both. You really need to learn both. 
You know, if you were to do a graph of all the UI kit apps and all the Swift UI apps, you wouldn't even see the bar of the Swift UI apps. It'd be invisible if you zoomed in and zoomed in like a fractal a thousand times. You might see some Swift UI apps. Maybe there's a few hundred versus a million, whatever it is, UI kit apps, right? Um, so <laughs> the, the weight of numbers behind values and stuff is 100% UI kit at this time. Um, so you need to learn both. Um, and that's going to carry on being true for a while. You know, I, I honestly, I can't imagine next year SwiftUI reaching parity with UIKit. It'll come a long way. They'll come along, you know, loads of things ship next year, but UIKit will move forward again. You know, UIKit isn't going to stand still next year. There'll be new UIKit stuff next year, uh, which SwiftUI may or may not get. I suspect it'll be 2021 before we get sort of full parity between SwiftUI and UIKit. Um, so it takes a bit of time to get there. It will get there. It is the future. But right now, it'll take some time. <sighs> Have I found problems with animations and views that are tied to scroll views? No, only because I haven't done it before. I mean, I've tried to think of using scroll view and animation, and I probably haven't. Um, but it would not surprise me if you see bugs all over the place right now, Swift UI, honestly. Only I would suggest if you are already on Hacking Surf Project 15 and UI Kit, continue to the end. Get to the end, do the best you can, um, and you will master UI Kit. Because if you were to, if you were to today say, I, you know, I've been through all 39 Hacking Surf projects. Can I get a job? Yes, you totally can. That's the point of the course. Gets you to be job ready as fast as possible. Um, and I honestly, I cannot think. Any single employee would say, hey, let's show me your SwiftUI experience, please. Oh, you haven't done SwiftUI? Well, you can't work here then. Um, they're going to query you on UIKit stuff. So you want to master UIKit, do the best you can, and then, yeah, be totally psyched about SwiftUI. It's lovely. Learn it, play with it, enjoy it, have fun. And if you are lucky enough to work at a company that uses SwiftUI, you are very fortunate. Enjoy it while you can. Um, but right now, you want to focus on your career is UI kit. Just is. Craig Clayton's in the house, my bro. How you doing, man? Um, can I recommend how to learn to type as fast as I can? Um, so one thing you can't see is that I'm typing on a touch bar MacBook Pro, which is why I make so many damn mistakes. I hate this keyboard. Uh, normally I use this other keyboard just behind my laptop right now, which is a mechanical keyboard, and it is a thing of beauty. It is uh, my Magis Touch mechanical keyboard with cherry blues, uh, and I love it and love it and love it, and you have to prize it out of my cold, dead hands, and I type significantly faster on that because I, I, I know where the keys are, and all muscle memory and so forth. Um, so yes. I should say, by the way, um, if you are following the Swift UI course, there might be problems this week because my MacBook Pro here, because it's a touch bar model, of course, the keyboard's dying. Uh, and it turns out battery's having problems too, because yay. Um, fortunately, I don't have Apple Care, but it's going to have to go in for repair this week on Friday. So it's possible I may not be able to make videos um, for one of the projects, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, approximately, because I haven't got a Mac. <laughs> I have to use my uh, iMac, which is nowhere near as good enough to do video recording. Um, so we may get chapters coming out and days stuff, but no videos for like three or four days. Um, we'll see. I'm, I'm going to try and, you know, work ahead and so forth, but it's not easy because it's a lot of work as you might imagine. Anyway, side note, <laughs> get a decent keyboard. Step one, get a, your, your best keyboard you can. Uh, core data questions. You know, I've used core data in SwiftUI, but not enough to feel really, really comfortable with it. Not so famous dog or not so famous dog. Um, so I, I really am not in a position yet to answer hard questions about core data with Swift UI because I'm still experimenting myself. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes, so Craig, I've spoken to them. Um, I've spoken to the actual repair technician doing the job and she said, you know, bring in Friday morning. I might be able to get it back Saturday, definitely otherwise Sunday. Um, so they're going to try. She'll, she'll do her best, and we'll see. Yeah, it is free. The battery thing wouldn't be free without Apple Care because the battery is having a really hard time right now thanks to this laptop being rubbish. Anyway, questions, 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 questions. Uh, what do we have? 
Can I show where I place the frame modifier for the content view? Of course I can, of course I can. It is down here, boom. It's, it's after the VStack. So we're saying literally our whole content view, our whole view itself has a fixed frame. That makes us have um, uh, this fixed size window. Uh, Chris Song, my quick thoughts and advice for a cross-platform online database. I have no problem with CloudKit. CloudKit works really, really well. Uh, and the pricing is amazing. It's so, so, so low. For anyone doing any meaningful work, it's, you know, uh, a few bucks. But for starters, it's free. So, yeah, CloudKit and the cross-platform JS thing you asked for, is it's absolutely fine. It works really well, too. And, of course, the Swift integration is beautiful as the quality integration too, it's really, really nice. Um, someone asked for a link to my Patreon. I haven't got a Patreon link yet. Um, I was just asking folks online um, because, you know, previously I was writing a book every three months. I was like, oh, what's cool? Mac OS or Vapor or whatever. Whatever was interesting, um, uh, I'd write a book about it and sell that and you know, pay for my, my mortgage, my kids and so forth to uh, keep me funded. Um, but this year I've been trying really, really hard to give away as much as I can. And that's why um, I did this podcast in San Jose where the sponsorship money went to App Camp for Girls. Uh, my entire conference I ran in July, all the money went to charity. We donated $30,000 to charity out of that, which is great. Uh, I'm working on a really massive project right now, which is amazing. I'm so psyched to see what you all think. Um, but it's not announced yet. It'll be announced um, in a month or, or two, perhaps. And all the money from that's going to charity. Um, I want to use this platform I have to make a difference to as many folks as I can, uh, which is why everything I've written this year has been available free. Everything. You know, uh, SwiftUI, by example, um, that book is 400 pages and it's all online free. The 100 Days of Swift, all online free on YouTube and on online. And the Swift UI stuff, all on, online on YouTube on, on the site. Um, so I'm trying really, really hard to support folks who haven't got the cash to buy books. Um, ultimately, though, I have to feed my kids and pay for my mortgage. <laughs> um, so I do need to find some way to um, make a living out of this that isn't just selling books. Um, I'm not saying I'm going to stop selling books. Of course, I'm going to carry on selling books. But, you know, I, 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 with my books, again, I, I, I want to make sure everyone feels they're getting most value they can. So if you bought Hacking with Swift for Swift 1, you've had updates for 1.2, 2.0, 2.2, 3, uh, 3.1, 4.0, 5.0, 6.0, 7.0, 8.0, 9.0, 10.0, 11.0, 12.0, 13.0, 14.0, 15.0, 16.0, 17.0, 18.0, 19.0, 20.0, 21.0, 22.0, 23.0, 24.0, 25.0, 26.0, 27.0, 28.0, 29.0, 30.0, 31.0, 32.0, 33.0, 34.0, 35.0, 36.0, 37.0, 38.0, 39.0, 40.0, 41.0, 42.0, 43.0, 44.0, 45.0, 46.0, 47.0, 48.0, 49.0, 50.0, 51.0, 52.0, 53.0, 54.0, 55.0, 56.0, 57.0, 58.0, 59.0, 60.0, 61.0, 62.0, 63.0, 64.0, 65.0, 66.0, 67.0, 68.0, 69.0, 70.0, 71.0, 72.0, 73.0, 74.0, 75.0, 76.0, 77.0, 78.0, 79.0, 80.0, 81.0, 82.0, 83.0, 84.0, 85.0, 86.0, 87.0, 88.0, 89.0, 90.0, 91.0, 92.0, 93.0, 94.0, 95.0, 96.0, 97.0, 98.0, 99.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 100.0, 
Uh, Chris says, what about sponsors? So, um, so Hacking with Swift now is... Zachary, that's very kind. Thank you very much. Um, Hacking with Swift now is now the largest dedicated Swift site in the world. I mean, it's the numbers are vast. We're, we're past something like 2 point something million page views a month now. It's it's really, really big, which is great. Um, and a sponsor would be great, actually. A sponsor would be good. I like a sponsor. Yeah, maybe a sponsorship. Maybe that. I don't know. Maybe the thing is, I, I think, realistically, it's going to end up being a blend of stuff. Some book sales, some Patreon support for free work, and some sponsorship to sort of run the main site. Um, it might be, end up being all three. Um, certainly, if you know any sponsors who want to sponsor the site, want to reach uh, so many thousands of users every single day, I think we're about 20,000 uh, people a day right now, which is, which is great, um, then... Uh, let me know. <laughs> I'd love to talk to them. If you don't know anyone who wants to sponsor the site, you just send them my way. I'll happily take their money and promote them to uh, my readers. Um, Hugo asks for the link to the assets. I'll post it again uh, to the chat window. As a reminder for folks watching later on, please don't use that link later on. You want to use the GitHub repo that will be on the uh, Swift on Sundays GitHub page, which I think is on a link already, but I'll just link to it again. Swift on Sundays. Boom, it's this one here. That's where the assets will be once the stream's over and edited by YouTube and ready to go live and so forth. Anthony, I'm glad you're enjoying it all. You know, I, I my entire mission right now is to help folks um, build their goals. You know, they, they want to get into a career with app development. They want to build the app that solves their problem. They want to do these things, and that's great. And I want to be there to help them reach those goals and that's the mission of what i'm doing is to um teach them swift teach them ui kit teach them sprite kit teach them swift ui teach them core image core graphics map kit you name it to help them reach their goals to help them reach aspirations to be the developer they want to get the job they want and then hopefully to carry on pushing them further you know i have some really advanced books like testing swift or swift design patterns or pro swift that will push your swift skills further You'll learn all sorts of new things in there to do better Swift. Mike, thank you. That's awfully kind. Thank you so much. Um, so I've got things, a lot of things for beginners and things that push them uh, into more advanced skills and so forth. Um, and, you know, I hope folks enjoy it and get the most out of it because uh, it's my job. <laughs> uh, BSM wants to see the app actually run, the final app. Yeah, sure. It's right back, actually. You watch me fail to spell once again. Uh, here we go. So we have um, these letters here. So the way the game works is you have four letters here to choose from, plus a timer counting down, and you can drag these words here, uh, to make that letter up here to make new letters like um, Dale's a word, or Sales a word, or Sane's a word, or Sign's a word, or Pine's a word, and so forth, um, to make new letters like that. And you can't make invalid words. You can't drop a Q in there, for example. And you can drop... Uh, New letters by this person, research the letters, or shuffle them like that. So it looks quite nice. That's the finished project right there. Okay. Uh, it is now 10 to 8. Do you have any more questions for me, or are we done for the evening? By the way, if you have questions afterwards, um, I have a Slack channel you can join, and you are welcome to um, find me on Twitter. I am Two Straws on Twitter. If you want to uh, uh, try and ask questions or show me your awesome... Um, Swift UI, challenge results, and so forth. Give me a video. I love seeing videos of things folks have made. It's great. Um, will I be adding Apple ID to my site? So the site doesn't have any um, login at all right now. There's no data being tracked on the site. Um, so there's no Apple login requirement. Um, and I don't see that changing. Um, so probably not. We'll see. Thank you very much, Pablunio, and thank you, Nikos. It's very kind. Thank you. Awful generous of you. I love the app. Good. The app's great fun. The app unwrap is awesome. Uh, and in fact, if I had the time, I'd love to add um, message kit to it because um, some of the 100 days stuff had these sort of fake chat things to help uh, give you more background material on the things you'd covered that day. I'd love to have that as a little SMS style or iMessage style chat window inside the app as well. So, um, if I had the time, of course, which I don't. There you go. 
Uh, Anthony, when's the next Fifth on Sundays? Um, you know, I don't know, but I, what I can say is that this is the 200th, oh, sorry, 20th, sorry, 200th. It's the 20th um, Sunday's stream, which means we've now built 20 full apps from scratch with video um, attached to it, which is great. It's been a lot of fun making these things. Uh, and um, what I think I'm going to do is turn it into a little book. Um, Swift on Sundays, Volume 1. So you can get the book form of all these projects to follow along in your own time with more detail, with more explanation, really going to detail on what things are doing and how they're working. Because that way I'll update them in the future as Swift changes, as part of my lifetime updates policy for all my Swift books. They all get free updates to Swift for life for the book, which is great. So if I make a book for um, Swift on Sundays, um, then... Um, that'll be out if I do it in about a month or so. We'll see. Um, so twenty is a good time. I think twenty in the twenty-one project, twenty projects in one book is a nice number, uh, a good amount of value for there uh, right now. So uh, yeah, <laughs> um, and that's a roundabout way of saying twenty is a nice time for me to pause, um, because as you might imagine, building a new project from scratch every week is intense. We've done 20 since January with a break with WW in the middle. It's been pretty intense for me to do this. Um, and uh, I need a break. <laughs> Particularly because right now I'm doing um, the uh, 100 days as well. So uh, this will be the last one of the Sunday streams for a while. I don't know how long, but certainly a little while, in a couple of months at least. Um, so I can have a, a break and focus on the Swift UI stuff. Now you may also know I've been running this... Um, Swift Oberfest, you know, because obviously, obviously, I'm 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 very bored, and I, I need to make more work for myself all the time. So for the last um, what are we on last twenty seven days, I've been posting a new article every day, twice. So there's a new Swift UI article and a new non Swift UI article uh, on the site. I'll link to it in the uh, chat thing down here. Um, and I've done what 27 of those so far, so we're on 52 uh, <laughs> uh, so far. So a lot, a lot, plus the Sunday streams. Plus, actually, this month I've actually been to um, uh, Poland and to Italy. I won an award in Poland. I, I won the best speaker, which is great. Actually, I'm very pleased with. I've been doing these talks in uh, conferences um, uh, and doing 100 day stuff at the same time. Yesterday, I just released updates for hacking with iOS and um, subscribe by example. So there's basically a lot of work right now. And of all those things, if I'm going to start easing back a little bit, you know, try and see my kids more than a few hours a day, play some games, hang out, not look at my computer all day, <laughs> I need a break. So I'm going to ease off the Sunday streams for the time being. Long answer to a very simple question. I apologize. Short version, there'll be a book. Um, it's going to be 20 projects in detail for all these Sunday streams with my lifetime update policy for Swift. Um, and um, it'll be out in a month or so and no more streams for the foreseeable future. Certainly at least until Christmas time because I want to get the Swift UI stuff done and dusted. That's a lot of work right now. Okay, more questions. Craig, I do I don't know how you do everything. You are my idol, bro. That's, that's, that's very kind. Um, Craig, honestly, uh, it's careful time management. It is um, fast typing speed. <laughs> it's years of training in, in writing. Um, it is... So actually, to be fair, the Swift Overfest stuff happened because um, I had this conference in July where I wanted to do WWDC in a day. Right, everything from this year in a day. And it was announced before Dub Dub happened, of course. So I had no idea it'd be quite this big. It was a huge, huge year. So I ended up making these tutorials to do in the day. I actually wrote a book just for that one day. Everyone got a printed 200-page book when they arrived. It was great. Anyway, um, and I wrote all these things down to, to cover. And I ended up with this, this massive collection of stuff I'd written that I had no space to put anywhere. I'm like, well, we only have one day, which is like eight hours, minus lunch breaks and minus, you know, coffee breaks and questions and so forth, um, I can't feasibly cover all this stuff. So I ended up just saying, okay, I'll just take it out of the day and use it 
in this Oktoberfest. So what you're kind of seeing is that uh, <laughs> the overflow from Hacking on Swift Live is uh, Swift Oktoberfest, things I could, didn't have time to squeeze into that one day. Um, so it has been easier than you might expect to get out three articles a day for a month. Yes. Swift Vember. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, it's not happening. It's not happening. Uh, I need to... Uh, Ease off a little bit, take a break, and relax. Keep in mind, even at a break, I'm still doing a 100 days thing every day, publishing a new project every three days in Swift UI, having a new test every third day, consolidation days, um, challenges, videos on YouTube. There's still stacks and stacks of things happening when I'm taking a break. It's just not quite as intense as it has been for October. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway. I already have an article on core data, lots of them. I mean, just not the ones you want. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, if you look on uh, the site, let me try and show you the link for this. Quick start Swift UI. So you go to um, my Swift UI book online, one of the books, I've got two books now, of course. Uh, and scroll down to core data. There you go, boom. That's all I have so far. Uh, if you just start from that bit there, and then scroll forwards. Um, yeah. So I did Swiftmas last year, Anthony, and it was it was uh, an article a day for 24 days. Uh, and it was intense because, um, you know, so, so, so the September thing I'm doing right now, sorry, September. I'm not doing it, not the September. Swiftoberfest I'm doing right now um, is, um, two articles a day plus 100 Swift UI. But the articles I'm doing are all really short. So um, like today's how to use uh, weights for connectivity for networking, that's the entire article right there. When I did Swiftmas last time, it was really intense. Um, there you are, I was Swiftmas 2019. Uh, and these things here were long. Um, so, okay, some were shorter perhaps, but the vast majority were long. So here's like build a Simon game in watchOS, the full thing right there. Uh, how to do regression analysis using CreateML, how to use uh, code coverage and so forth. Some of these were really, really long things. Like how to create a snow scene with core animation. Um, it walks you through the entire thing, adding a background thing, uh, then making snow fall down with animation, then uh, adding snow at the bottom and so forth. That's a long article with screenshots and stuff. That took me a few hours to write plus then tweeting about it in a meaningful way, these things were intense. Um, so uh, Swiftmas this year, if it happens again, will be different, it'll be simpler, because I'm still doing the SwiftUI stuff if it happens. Anyway. Do I have any other job? No, this is my entire job, is monkeying around with Swift. That's all I do. I look at Swift and say, huh, this is cool. I try it out. I throw it away. I try it out, so something else, and throw that away. Then try something else, and throw that away. And eventually, I find something I like that is good, that is exciting to teach, and I've got a good explanation for it. Because if, if I've got something really good and, and uh, valuable, but I can't explain it in a way I think is useful or, or useful, uh, uh, interesting, it goes in the bin. Um, so... When I hit that sort of Venn diagram of exciting and useful and explainable in an entertaining way, then I publish it. Um, so I literally spend all my time, nine till three or so, writing Swift, throwing away Swift, writing it again, trying macOS, trying Vapor, trying you name it. Uh, that's my full-time job. And what you see is a fraction of what I actually do. You know, I throw away a lot of junk. I just don't like, for example. You know, um, I was looking recently at the um, test metrics in iOS 13. They're really cool, but they're not great. They're just not they're not stable enough yet in my tests to write about them. So I do this work, researching them, getting them right, get it right, and then it's not good enough to go. And it sort of sits in the back burner for, you know, three months away, uh, whenever that ships. Um, so, yeah, you're seeing sort of the, the highlight reel of Hacking Swift, as it were. Um, Bob Godwin X. Am I planning, uh, planning a conference of my own again? We're not actively planning it, um, but it's very likely to happen. 
Folks really enjoyed the last one we did. We raised, like I said, $30,000 for an amazing charity, um, which was all our profit, basically. We kept nothing at all for ourselves. Um, it was intense, you know, writing a 200-page book in between Dub Dub and Conference Day. Given it had to be printed as well, I had to leave a week earlier to go and get actually printed on paper, um, was intense. Um, but, it, you know, we raised, I say, great money for charity, so I think we might do it again. Um, curiously, we already had two sponsors get in touch saying, hey, can we do it again next year? Um, which is great. That's a, a real um, seat of approval. They like the idea. So we'll see. Uh, when and where will I be in Poland? I already was in Poland. I was in Krakow um, three weeks ago for MobiConf. I spoke there and I, I, I won Best Speaker, which was great for my talk, uh, which is actually online, by the way. If you want to see the talk, I did uh, it online on YouTube and it's really good. It's called um, How to Build an App Store, a collection we like the App Store, I think it's called. And um, I can probably find a link to it somewhere. Um, but uh, it's a good talk about the new uh, compositional collection view layout stuff from iOS 13. It's a really, really powerhouse feature from iOS 13. Um, and recommended very much. If I go to YouTube and do Collection View App Store, boom, that talk right there. There's some guy chatting away. I'll just pause that and paste the link into the chat window. Go and check that out because that is a a good talk. And you know, we build the entire App Store pretty much, well, the entire Collection View App Store, sorry, I should say, over the period of like 45 minutes or so. Stopping to have questions and so forth. Are there any pictures somewhere I can see the finished product? There we go. So you can see we basically build the, the full app store style thing. We can scroll around and different layouts, always in one collection view. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely little video. Go and check that out. Uh, Dennis, uh, a Patreon I think is going to happen, um, but we'll see. I need to consider the sponsorship thing too. But like I said, I think it'd be a blend. You know what I'd really like to do? This is, uh, this is not in any way a promise of me doing this what i'd really like to do is to be able to have a patreon for folks who want to support the site and then use the patreon api to have on every page brought to you by sponsors and you click on there you see everyone's picture everyone who's sponsoring the site right now this this month um so you are publicly acknowledged as helping run the site because you know my as you might imagine with a two point x million page views my hosting fees are not insubstantial um so um yeah i'd like to have like a every page one person's picture appears with their name or something support you by so and so and list all the others but but i'm not promising that that's what i'd like to do um so that everyone who sponsors it can really feel like they are personally helping run the entire site um and then if i get a company sponsor as well that'll just go alongside like a company like a like a um uh event sponsor like you know platinum sponsor is some company hudson heavy industries and then individual sponsors have many folks want to sponsor the site but I, so i feel i you know i, I don't want to do subscriber content i don't want to say yeah here's secret swift videos for my subscribers because the whole point of this is to fund the creation of free content so the whole world can afford to, to, to... Huh. siri's playing songs black and gold thank you for that siri um so yeah the whole point, the point is to find fund free content on on youtube or the website um i might do someone suggested actually i might do um uh like insider stuff like how i do my writing or how my setup is or you know uh, my personal way of approaching problems and so forth but the actual swift stuff my goal is to make that all free so folks can benefit no matter how rich or poor they are that's my goal um but we'll see it's all up in the air and uh Whatever, whatever keeps a roof over my head is what I care about ultimately. I've got, I've got two kids and they're, they're expensive kids. They eat a lot of food. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, BSM asks, uh, any ideas for a practice project to practice what I learned in Hacking with iOS? So hopefully, you've, if you finish that book, you've been through 39 projects um, and expanded them all with challenges. And you have gone through the guidebook and done a further 10 complete projects from scratch, um, which is a lot. So you're talking, you know, 30, 40 or more projects you've built. Um, so I haven't got any extra specially new ideas on top of that. I would say that mostly, as it's turning out, 
mostly the uh, Swift UI is original stuff. So I'm doing this new thing um, here, um, which is uh, books Swift UI. Uh, these are all new projects. Now, occasionally, you'll see when you recognize, like guess the flag here, for example, that thing is also in the UI kit edition, so you can compare the two. But we split's new, guess the flag isn't, that's new, um, that's new. Uh, Word Scramble is a modified UI kit project to be more um, social UI friendly. That's new. Um, you know, of the remainder, most of them are new. So there's lots and lots of more new projects coming your way if you want more things to cut your teeth on. Um, plus, of course, the guidebook for this um, has um, more challenges again um, down here. So you can say, you know, what is my challenge here? And it's to build a rock, paper, scissors app right there. Um, so yeah, check that out as well. So there's lots of ideas. I try and put them in as I can. Um, Chris Song asks, do I plan to do more digging into difficult data source? Yes, I do. It's a short version. Um, uh, I need to spend some time. I would love to do that as part of um, Swiftoberfest, but realistically, I want to get it right. You know, for example, I was doing it um, at a workshop in Italy to attend it uh, two weeks ago, and um, I walked through doing it in a table view, and then I said, okay, now you folks do the same thing for this other table view. And straight away they hit the problem, which is, well, how do I control section titles? Oh, hello, dogs. How do I control section titles? How do I add a section to headers and so forth? And the answer is, well, you've got to um, subclass your, come on, come on, come on, get up here, come on, come on, good guy. You got to subclass your data source. Um, so uh, that takes extra knowledge, extra thinking to do, and, and it's not hard to do, but you got to know how to do it. So, um, good guy, get out of here. Um, if I'm going to do it, when I do it, I want to do it right and make the most of it I can, so it's the best I can. Not a sort of a quick, oh hello Luna, have some tea. Not a quick um, Stoberfest article, something longer I think, it deserves it. Come on, good girl, good dog. <laughs> could you get a wine company? Yes I could, then again, get a wine company. Uh, it'd be a little bit alcoholic, but there you go. Um, Ponderasti, how do I handle juggling between uh, different apps um, or tasks? Um, so I, I work in a, a really simple um, approach. Like my, my, my entire approach to uh, coding is trivial, in fact. Um, I multitask very, very badly. I just don't do it. Come on. I just don't do it. My brain doesn't work like that. Uh, and that sucks. I, you know, if I were better at multitasking, I'd say, I'm going to pause this and do this for a while, then pause that and do that for a while. And, da, da, da. Um, and I just can't do that. My brain does not work that way. So I work intensively on one thing and then finish it and stop and move on. Um, what that means is I write stuff extremely quickly. I mean, I'm not going to say the, the actual numbers because it would terrify you. Um, but if I am in the zone, I'll put a book out shockingly fast. Because I'll sit down and do nine hours of non-stop typing at my speed, which is a lot of typing. Um, so I put an entire book out extremely quickly. And that's great for me. That's how my brain works. Here's what I want to say. I shall get the words down in Markdown and off to GitHub and so forth to publish it. Uh, but it means that I have a very strong sense of continuity. Like, you know, when you're looking at 100-day stuff, when you're in the, the challenge, um, whenever you're reading any part of here, you're looking at, I don't know, here, the challenges. I'm giving you challenges to do for each topic. Not there, sorry, this one. Um, do this, then do this and this, right? Stuff to do. And I know you can do all those things. I know it's within the reach of everyone following this course because they've covered it already because I have the entire course in my head, because I have zero context switches. I've been doing this 100 days thing constantly and nothing else, and it means the entire stack of everything you know so far is in there. I can write challenges very, very easily and refer back to what you've done previously trivially, and that's why I do it. It means I get a very clear, seamless writing flow, and I work much, much faster. Um, so I just don't multitask, and I wish I could, 
I envy folks who can. I cannot. My brain is not geared that way. I am very much a single-threaded straw, <laughs> as opposed to two straws. Yes. Um, Rahul asks, could I create a crypto price tracking app? Could I? Yes. Will I? No. There's your answer. Bitcoin today uses more energy than 50 or 60 countries, including some large ones like Switzerland and Ireland uh, and Singapore, right? And I don't want to contribute to the active destruction of the planet, bluntly. So no, I will not be making a crypto price tracking app. I refuse to be involved in that hot mess. Okay, folks, it is now 10 or 12-ish minutes past uh, 8. I can hang around a few minutes more. Of course, if you have questions, you can uh, hit me on Twitter. You can email me. I'm paul at hackingwithswift.com. Um, or you can go to the Slack workspace, ask questions there. Honestly, whatever works best for you, it's all good. Um, Slack's preferred, because <laughs> that way other folks can help out. Um, but I'm uh, failing that Twitter. Anthony, I'm glad you like the approach. Um, I have a very, very single-minded vision for the books I want to write. I wrote this book on Mac OS, and it's still, even today, the only course on Mac OS out there. And um, it's 18 projects. It's supposed to be 12, but I had just so much fun writing it. It was just in so enjoyable. I expanded it and expanded it and expanded it. Ended up shipping with six extra projects for the initial release because it was just so much fun. Uh, and that's the the place I put myself. I'm going to get into the world of this thing and enjoy it and do great things with it and have so much fun and just let that come through on the page. Same for WatchOS. You know, the WatchOS book I wrote, is, um, it's, I, I made a game with SpriteKit on WatchOS. It's great fun. Uh, you've got to use a little digital crown to control a little spinning wheel with balls hitting it and so forth. It's really fun. And I love making apps for watchOS. I love it for macOS and, and Vapor. Uh, and that's why you won't see a book from me about CloudKit. <laughs> you just won't. I, it doesn't excite me. And I get it. It excites loads of other folks out there who want to write a CloudKit book. Brilliant. You do it. Metal. Go. Do it. Metal book. Never from me. I do not find it exciting, and if I don't find it exciting, I will not help you find it exciting. All right, folks, that is now quarter past eight. I want to thank you again for coming along. Thank you for being a lovely audience. Um, you've had some really good questions, which is always good to have. Uh, again, this project will be on GitHub uh, in, I don't know, an hour and a bit or so. Um, and YouTube, because this video has taken more than um, two hours, YouTube will totally screw up the video. So you'll see a bad video at first, give it three or four hours, it'll figure it out, and I'll push the link to the YouTube and the GitHub code all at the same time, probably tomorrow morning, so you can all check it out. If you have not already liked the video, please do. I mean, YouTube looks at those likes as a way of recommending videos to other people. Um, so if you're not like the video, please do. It helps more folks discover Swift and Sundays, discover my work, and encourages me to make more videos like this one. Um, again, follow me on Twitter. Uh, otherwise, see you on GitHub. And uh, thank you very much for coming.